Lord, we are gathered in your name. Father Lord, we just want to give here all who be affected by the presence of the Holy Spirit here. Yeah. We ask Lord, please take everything that is lost that is not of you. Put your word in our hearts. Father Lord, renew our minds. Open up your scriptures to us, Lord. Speak directly to us, not from any man, not from any person, but from you, Lord. Holy Spirit, take over. Father, let no person live here the same way in the name of Jesus. Father, let every skill cover in our eyes, take it out. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and they do not do. Remember we talked about this scripture two weeks ago. And, and, and we understood that Christ was saying that these people open up the scriptures correctly. However, they were not doing what they were teaching. Now, we, we actually looked at one of the ways they interpreted the scriptures. That uh, two weeks ago, which was um, they call it ration, which is is like an allegorical explanation of the scriptures. When you use scriptures to interpret scriptures, there are three other other techniques they use. The first one is actually called the shards, which is just a simple understanding of the scripture. You read a scripture, and God created the earth, the heavens, and the earth. The simple meaning, you understand that. And then there's another layer, which is remes. Remes is actually the hinted meaning in the scripture. The hinted meaning in the scripture. I give an example. Joseph was blessed. Joseph had a gift to interpret dreams. But Pharaoh was the one that had a dream. Now Pharaoh, we can say he was not a believer. But he needed a son of God to interpret the dream. So we can take a hint that God also gives dreams to unbelievers. You understand? So that's the hinted meaning. So God can give an unbeliever a dream, he give an unbeliever a vision. Okay? And then the other one was Drash, which we looked at how we could use scriptures to interpret scriptures. And then the last one is called swords. Swords are like um, revelations. Revelations in the scriptures. Now, these are some of the techniques that these people use to interpret scriptures and they use up to today to interpret scriptures. Now, let's step in a bit. If you look at um, Psalms 128, verse 6, it says, Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be unto Israel. Now, it's very interesting how God introduced himself at some places in the Bible. In Exodus 3, verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. 
If you look again in Matthew 22, verses uh, 32, it says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. First of all, before we even go back there, <laughs> this scripture, when, God, when Christ was actually saying, God, God is not the, the God of the, of the dead. And he's saying that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It means that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive, even right now. That's what that scripture was saying. But anyway, let's go, we'll, we'll, we'll come back there again. Acts 3 verse 1 says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, who you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now, listen, it's very interesting if God should introduce himself. He's pointing us to something. He's saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He wants you to go back and look at what was the spiritual journey that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had? What lessons can you learn from them? Now, even while we're thinking about that, we have to remember something. And I mentioned this last week, two weeks ago. Every letter in the Bible, every word in the Bible, every name, every date, Every age is a message. Every single word in the Bible was put there for a reason. Now, before the Exodus, how was the word of God actually transferred? And remember, we're, we're asking ourselves a question. We're asking that, will your children's children's children know your God? But, before the Exodus, how did it happen? In the Exodus, Moses received the word of God that he was asked to write down. But before the Exodus, we had the Oral Bible. It was actually called the Oral Torah. It was the Oral Bible. So there was an Oral Bible that was passed down right from Adam. You see, first of all, okay, let's, look, let's do a quick, let's look quickly into some scriptures. We don't need to open them. But you can note them down. In Genesis 5:4, with the you can see Adam, and Adam lived 930 years. In Genesis 5:8, set 912 age. In Genesis 5:11, Enoch 905. Enoch, Canaan 910. In Genesis 5:14. In Genesis 5:17, Mahalele 895 by age. Jared, 962. Edom, 365, one day. Metisela, 969. Lamech, 777. Noah, in Genesis 929, 950. Shem, 600 years. In Genesis 11, 10 to 11. Selah, 433. In Genesis 11, still. Iba, 464. Peleg, 239. Ryu, 239. Sarah, in Genesis 11, 22 to 23, 230 years. Nebo, 148 years, Genesis 11, 24 to 25. Terah, 205 years, Genesis 11, 32. Abraham, 175 years, Genesis 25, 7. Isaac, 180 years, Genesis 35, 28 to 29. But what, all this is, what does all this mean when we go through these numbers? I'd like you to imagine something. Can you imagine that Lamech, the father of Noah, talking to Abraham and saying, tell me again, what is it like to talk with God in the Garden of Eden? Lamech was the father of Noah. Imagine talking to Adam, asking him, how was it to walk in the Garden? According to genealogies, it was recorded that Adam did not die until Lamech was 56 years. What about Abraham saying to Shem, tell me again, how, how you and your brothers, Ham, Jephat, your father Noah built the ark? Tell me, how was, the, how, how was the ark built? How was it like to live one year 
during the flood with all those animals. Again, it was recorded through the genealogies that Shem was alive in Abraham's days. It's very important the knowledge of your God that you are passing to your children and your children's children. This word wasn't even written down then. But right from Adam, it was passed. The question we need to ask and reflect right now is, even for those that are not yet married, what about your God? What information about your own God will you pass to the upcoming generations? If you use simple arithmetic in Latin, it's actually called Anno Mundi. So usually abbreviated as AM. Adam was created on the sixth day of the first year and died AM 930. He could have spent precious time with his descendants all the way down to Noah's father, Lamech, who was also born AM 874. And Noah's son, Shem, born AM 1558 and died AM 2158, could have talked with his descendants all the way down to including Abraham, born AM 2008. We can see, the, we can verify that from um, Genesis 7 verse 6, which says Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So we see that Noah was born AM 1056, and so the flood occurred 600 years later, so that's AM 1656, which was 352 years before Abraham was born. Then notice that Shem died, Shem, Shem died AM 2158, and Elba died 2187. Both outlived their descendants down to Abraham. The genealogy. If you want to go back and study this, you can study. Uh, Genesis chapter 5 and 11, 1 Chronicles 1, and then Luke 3. The big question is, will your children's children's children know your God? This information was passed down from fathers to children, from children to children, to children to children. They all knew. Can you give what you don't have? How much of your God do you know? You see, this is very critical now because if you actually listen to the news, you see what's happening in our society. There's a lot of pollution and contamination, even in our schooling system. You see, they're trying to implant doctrines that are not biblical. These were countries that were formerly founded on the Bible. America, even the UK. But now, they're bringing in laws that were not there before. They are contaminating that which is holy. At age five, the Hebrew child can recite the first, the whole Old Testament by hand. By age five. By age thirteen, they have their permissible. So they decide: Are they going to go with teaching the word of God, or go with another trade? Maybe their father's ready. Their father wasn't um, a, a, a teacher of the law of the word of God or something. How much of God are you impacting into this generation? Children learn from what they see at home. So it's not even as much as just you reading it. Are you living the Bible? A child's word is his father's if, if, if you talk to some children and say, and daddy, daddy said I shouldn't open the door for strangers. Mommy said I shouldn't open the door for strangers. They take your word. But then you go back and tell them they stood fair. You confuse them. You can't tell a child a lie today and expect that tomorrow when he finds out, you confuse him. You have to tell him the truth. Do not build it based on lies. No. If you are not going to take him out today, don't say tomorrow I'm going to take you out for ice cream. Tomorrow the child comes and he says that. And then you say, no, 
man and you, you change your mind. No. If you don't intend to take him out, don't say I will. Because you are teaching him what it means to be honest. We must always speak the truth. You see, the beauty of the scripture is that even when God tells us he's the God of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's not that these people were perfect. No. Look at, look at Abraham. See, in, see, see what happened in Genesis 12.10. He said, Abraham lied about his wife. He said, now there was, if there was a famine in the land and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there. For the famine was severe in the land and it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen that when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is the wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister. That is, that it may be well with me for your sake. And that this same thing that Abraham did, he saw and followed and did it. No, it was in his character. He Later on in the scriptures, it was that he said he was afraid that these people did not know God. But the problem was that he didn't trust God enough to protect him. See, God was showing that even our father of faith, Abraham, had to walk in knowing God to build up that faith. So the only man that came perfect was Jesus. So even though that God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he points us back to them. But these people grew in knowledge of God. So they had faults, they had weaknesses. In, in, um, in Genesis 26, 6, it says, So Isaac dwelt in, in Gerar, and the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, She is my wife, because he thought less the men of this place kill me for Rebecca, because she's a beautiful, she's beautiful to behold. Same thing his father did. He didn't trust in God. Now God will protect him. He was afraid. It's so awesome that if you even go back to the story of how Isaac was blessed with his wife, the story was passed down to the children. He saw the servant was instructed. Again, there's a spiritual lesson to be learned there. The servant was brought up like a child in those days like your own child. And Abraham came and said, swear you will go and find my son a wife. Not from this place, from my, from my kindred. And he went. And the servant said, ah, he prayed to himself. If the God of my father can answer me, that's Abraham. He now gave a condition. I will take all these camels. I will ask the lady for a drink of water. And that perhaps, if the right woman, for the right woman, she will come back to me and say, not only take water, but she will give water to all the camels. I had to actually check this out. One camel drinks about 30 gallons of water. That's about 135 liters of water. Imagine, it takes about, I did the math, it takes about, um, about 13 minutes, uh, thereabout, for one camel to drink water properly before it's, it's settled. So imagine, Going to the well, throwing the bucket, bringing the back, going to give one camel. How many times? Then she did that for 10 camels. Willingly. With a smile on her face. A hundred, she, she gave for over two hours, about two hours, ten minutes. That's if the camels were drinking fast, by the way. Two hours, ten minutes of going back to the well, fuel, fresh, come back, give them. A wife is a wife before she walks down the altar. The Bible says a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. The Bible didn't say a man that finds a woman. He said a wife. It's not walking down the altar that makes the woman a wife. No. She was a wife. It was in her nature, in her character. She did it really willingly. For our women in the house, what do we learn from that? 
is not babes. Men don't look for babes. Men marry wives. In the same light, it's not only the children that make you mothers. Sorry? It's not only having children that make you mothers. Oh, yes. A lot of people marry for the wrong reasons. So it's just about now, about the glamour on that day. But also remember what the scripture also says. When they brought the wife, what was the boy doing? He was meditating. Boys don't get married. Men do. Men in God. He was a man in God. He was meditating. He was spending time with God. <coughs> this story was passed to the son. <coughs> Jacob heard how his father found his own wife. And when he was instructed to go and find his own wife, what did he do? When he first woman he saw there and he heard ah, that this is the daughter of your uncle. Ah, he thought this history is repeating himself again by the well. Beautiful woman again. He made his heart. The first thing he did, he was so much in love, he was there crying. He kissed her cheek and started crying. But that's questionable. She was not the one with the promise. She was not the one that brought up the children. It was her sister. What do we learn from that? It's not at a glance that you should, you should make decisions. He made his decision based on what he saw and based on the story. So because of somebody else's testimony, doesn't mean that that's how your own testimony should come. That's right. And again, what did he do? He saw the figure. Many men marry because of the appearance of the woman. They don't, they don't spend time to see who she really is inside. The Bible describes it. I'm just speaking really fast so that we don't spend too much time because time is already gone. The story was told to him. Boy, at that point he didn't understand. He just ran with it. But we thank God for his mercies. That God still guided him. And he met his uncle. His character, Jacob, his character, he was he was a 419 person. But he met someone that, that had a better degree in 419 than him. He swerved him for seven years for one girl. The night of the wedding gave him enough alcohol that he couldn't see. Couldn't recognize the woman that he slept with and then he married the wrong woman. And then he had to work for another seven years again. And he kept doing that and doing that, but he didn't mind. Until God revealed to him who he was. His uncle did not want him to go because his uncle had gone to, 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 to native doctors to ask, how am I being blessed? And the native doctor said, look, don't let that man go. That man is the cause of your blessing. If you trust in God, you don't need to chase after the blessing when you have the blesser. Our stories, our journeys are different. But when we trust in God, when we get to know this God and His knowledge becomes part of us, we are able to live this life right and we are able to pass this knowledge down onto our children. What would they stand on? The Bible says, if the foundations are faulty, what can the righteous do? Foundations. The foundations for the children is very important. In our society, I'm, even, I'm afraid of some of the schooling systems that we have now. What are they schooling your child? What is the programming? down to even the media, the things we watch, the music we hear, what kind of spirit has they in plan, what kind of knowledge, those things that we see before and cringe, now we see them and we're okay. Because they have desensitized our system and they are also trying to desensitize your children's system. Because the truth about it is to destroy any nation is they target the children. But God said that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the knowledge of God was passed down from Adam, like I've shown you. And all of them walked in that line. They got to know their God. They got to know their God.
We need to ask ourselves. We have come to a land that is a bit different in culture. In Africa, you, 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 you help your neighbor to bring up their own children. You see a child doing something wrong, you correct him in love. But here, we, we, you, even up to now, I still don't know some of my neighbors. <laughs> because I, I'm even afraid to knock. Maybe how would they receive me? Most times I try to look out so I can say hi. Just to say hello, to start a conversation. It's important. We know our God. If not, there's going to be lots of problems. Jacob became Israel. God showed him that he had the Bekorah. In Hebrew, there are two blessings. There's the blessing for the firstborn. It's a whole different lesson. But let me just give you a hint here. He understood that he himself had the blessing. So it didn't matter what he was doing. It didn't matter what he had to do. Even if it was dunk he was carrying, God will bless him still. That was why when he saw his brother, he told the brother that the brother can take all he has, take all the sheep, all the cattle, that he has it all. If you translate that text to the actual Hebrew, he says, I have it all. Because he knows he has God. It didn't matter that the brother take all the sheep, take all the cattle. God will still bless him again. A lot of us, God has that blessing. We have that blessing from God. But we are kings living like paupers because we don't know who we are. We need to have the knowledge of our God so that we can pass it on to our children. In Psalm 126, he says in his ways, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy. It shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruit, a fruitful vine in the very heart of her house, of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Amen. Yes, may you see your children's children peace beyond upon Israel. Let us pray.